the speaker today is Lena Emma from uh, Polio, who works on explanation and chance and a bunch of other things in philosophy of science. Thanks. So thanks for the invitation and to all of you for coming. So this is very much a work in progress. It's an argument that I've been thinking about at least since I finished the first paper that uh, became part of my dissertation, so a while now. And it's the kind of paper where I, at various times over the past few years, have thought that I had a really good draft done. And then I would uh, present it a couple times or think about it and realize I totally wanted to change it. So you'll see as we go, I get less and less sort of assertive about the claims that I am making. And um, I'm hoping that, especially toward the end, you all can help me figure out or just sort of think through um, the current way that I'm thinking about things and help me sort that out a little bit. So, Okay, so the topic is deterministic chance. Deterministic chances are non-trivial objective probabilities that arise in worlds where the fundamental laws are deterministic. So by non-trivial, I just mean that they're not just equal to zero or one, they take values between zero and one. And by objective, I mean that they are determined by the world as it is independent of us as sort of inquirers trying to figure out what the world is like. So they are independent of the beliefs that we have, the evidence that's available to us, the kinds of strategies that are sort of useful for creatures structured like us to figure out what the world is like, independent of all of those things. That's what I mean by objective probabilities. And what I'm interested in is a certain kind of argument for deterministic chance. So I think that when we're looking at arguments for deterministic chance, there's a couple of distinctions that are helpful. So on the one hand, there's a distinction between arguments that just try to establish the metaphysical possibility of deterministic chance. So these are arguments that try to show that there's nothing in the nature of chance and the nature of determinism that makes them incompatible. Um, there's a handout somewhere, yeah. So often these arguments take the form of um, objecting to certain, kind, certain interpretations of so-called platitudes about the chance concept that you might otherwise think make chance incompatible with determinism. So these are arguments that, the way I like to think about them is that they're arguments that establish that uh, deterministic chances are metaphysically possible. On the other hand, you have arguments that try to do something more, so they try to establish that deterministic chances are actual or are or exist in possible worlds that are fairly nearby. So the ones that are of particular interest, I think, are the possible worlds that are compatible with our best deterministic scientific theories. Okay. So these are arguments that try to establish that deterministic chances actually exist, or they would exist if our best deterministic scientific theories are true. I take it to be open question right now whether or not um, our, best determinist, our best deterministic scientific theories are our best scientific theories full stop. Um, Okay, but I take it they're still relevant. So the argument that I'm interested in today falls into that latter camp. Okay, so I have a previous paper on deterministic chance that was very much in the former camp, so I was arguing, arguing that deterministic chances are metaphysically possible. There's nothing in the, sort of the concept of chance that keeps them from arising in deterministic worlds. That, uh, I still like that argument a lot, but I am interested in trying to make a stronger one. So trying to make the argument that deterministic chances arise in the actual world or in worlds uh, where our best deterministic scientific theories are true. Okay, so within that uh, latter group of theories, I think there's another, or of arguments, I think there's another distinction that's helpful. So that's between arguments for deterministic chance that, as I think of it, start with metaphysics and those that start with science. So on the one hand, you have arguments for deterministic chance that start by saying, look, here's my metaphysical theory of chance in general. And then I look at deterministic worlds and voila, those things show up in deterministic worlds too. So there are deterministic chances. Okay, so like a really easy way to have this kind of argument is if you were like a straightforward actual frequentist about 
chances. Obviously, in deterministic worlds, there are going to be relative frequencies of events, at least in a lot of deterministic worlds, I guess. Uh, so voila, you've got deterministic chances if you're an actual frequentist about chance. Um, there are other arguments, some of which uh, Barry has made in print and other people as well, that start with a sort of Lewis-inspired Lewis uh, best systems analysis of chance and argue if we look at deterministic worlds, uh, chances show up in those worlds on that kind of metaphysical account as well. Okay. So the argument that I'm interested in is not that kind of argument. So I'm not starting from the metaphysics, from some sort of metaphysical theory of chance. Instead, I want to start from a certain role that chances play in our best deterministic scientific theories and see what kind of, co what kind of consequences we can draw for the metaphysics of chance from that. So sort of let the scientific role that chances play guide the metaphysics that we come up with instead of starting with a certain kind of metaphysics as a constraint. And the particular argument that I'm interested in, that I'm exploring, I'm still not totally sure uh, that I, well, I'm not sure at all that I endorse it, is uh, the explanatory role argument for deterministic chance. So there's a version of it at the top of your handouts, the first page of the handout. This is the one I'm going to focus on. It's sort of the easy one to do with classical statistical mechanics. The argument is obviously of interest in part because probabilities look like they work in a very similar way in Bohmian mechanics. So the version that I'm going to work with is the first premise just says probabilities explain statistical mechanical phenomena. And then the second premise says that in order to explain statistical mechanical phenomena, the relevant probabilities have to be objective. Okay. The conclusion then is that there are deterministic chances. Yeah, Harry. Um, are, you, are you drawing any do you draw any distinction between the term chance and the term probabilities, or are they being used interchangeably? Um, I'm using chance interchangeably with objective probability. Objective probability is, a prob is, is what you said is a probability that is independent of us. Yeah. Right? Yeah. A lot ends up hinging on that, so I think it's a good place to push. Um, so, what I said is objective probabilities are independent of us as sort of inquirers about the world. They're determined by the world as it is independent of us as beings that inquire about the world. So it's independent of our actual beliefs. I said three things that it was independent of. Our actual beliefs, the evidence that's available to us, and also the kinds of creatures we are. So insofar as the kinds of creatures we are sort of constrains the way that we go about trying to figure out what the world is like, that can't play a role in determining what the, um, what the objective probabilities are on this way of understanding objective. Okay, now I think it's definitely, we often talk like there's subjective and objective probabilities this way. What I just said should immediately make you think there's going to be like grades about objectivity. So you can have things that are independent of some of the, what I just listed and not others. So there's a lot of um, important philosophical content right there, I think. So the fact that chances, uh, let's see, a chance, the chances uh, independently of us determine relative frequency. Say. Um, but the fact that we we uh, regard frequencies as a form of probability is, the, you know, I mean, you know, there's, I guess I'm trying to think of there's a mechanism, a chance mechanism, which on its face has nothing to do with the ratio of, of favorable events over total events. But then we see the roll of the dice and we see, okay, one-sixth of the time it came up one, and, or, and so we, we regard that as the probability. Mm -hmm. um, so our, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to parse that where, in what sense is that probably independent of us as observers and that we are choosing to represent the result of this chance mechanism by this frequency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so certainly the following is true. When we see that the coin, always, when we see that the die always lands with, you know, six 
facing up a sixth of the time, then we take that to be really good evidence of what the chances are. Um, and we also set our credence, our degree of belief in, the, say, the coin or the die landing with six up um, the next time to be one sixth. Um, so those, I think, are independent claims of the question of what is the what is the chance? So we could have misleading evidence, like that we could just have had a really unlucky run. In fact, it's a very heavily weighted die um, that just happened to be unlucky for us. It's been behaving like a fair die. So, um, so the evidence is misleading in that regard. Does that help? Yeah, no, I, mean, I, I think that, I think so. so okay. Like I said, I, I think that there's a lot packed into the definition of objective that I gave, and it might be a place where you want to get off the boat, um, given what happens later. So the reason why, why I care about this particular argument for deterministic chance, um, one reason is because a bunch of prominent philosophers of physics have endorsed it. So uh, I'm, I'm no historian, but... Um, so a lot of it traces back to Albert in Time and Chance, where he makes something very much like this argument. Um, Barry has also made this argument in print. Goldstein, Meacham, North have all made it in print. Um, sorry? Which argument? The explanatory role argument that's on the top of your handout. Or some version of it. Um, I'm also interested because I think that these kinds of explanatory role arguments are some of the strongest arguments that we have in metaphysics. So I think that these kinds of arguments where you say, um, here's a certain kind of phenomena, the phenomena has to have an explanation, are often used in science to justify the introduction of really metaphysically weird or totally novel entities. And the fact that that happens a lot in science gives us uh, license to do something similar in metaphysics. So it's a very strong kind of argument, or at least in the past it has been used to license the introduction of otherwise really surprising sorts of things. So insofar as it works, it's a really, uh, it's a very strong kind of argument, or it has this connection to other arguments that have been uh, used in a fairly strong way. I'll say a little bit more about this um, later too, but I also think that this is sort of the strongest argument that there is for chances in indeterministic contexts is an argument just like this. So insofar as this justifies deterministic chance, this kind of argument um, establishes the existence of deterministic chance, we've got a nice parallel between the indeterministic and deterministic cases. I'm going to say more about that. Um, one thing I just want to emphasize here is that, so I'm going to interpret the relevant sets of explanations such that all the action in the argument here is in P1. Okay. So that means that, so I take P2 on the way, the way I'm understanding explain in P2. P2 should be sort of immediately obvious to everybody. So I'm understanding explanation here such that the explanation of some phenomena is the reason why that phenomena occurs. It's not, say, just anything that gives us understanding or a feeling of satisfaction or something like that. It's a very robust kind of, uh, the word metaphysical is kind of contentious here, but like an ontic sense of explanation, sometimes people say, as opposed to a more epistemological sense of explanation. Okay, so if what explains some phenomena is just the reason why that phenomena occurs, I take it that everybody agrees that um, whatever explains statistical mechanical phenomena has to be something objective. Okay, so nothing about us or the beliefs we have or the evidence we have or what's like a good strategy for us in navigating around the world is the reason why, you know, an ice cube melts in water or a banana rots when you leave it sitting on the counter for two weeks or any other statistical mechanical pheno phenomena you care to identify. Okay, so all the action here, given that way of understanding explanation, is going to be in P1. Is reason why the cause? So I am um, going to, so I think paradigm 
explanations of this sort are causal explanations, but I take it that there are more than just causal explanations. Yeah. Insofar as you did think reason why means cause, and that's going to give you some pretty significant, uh, that's going to tell you something pretty significant about deterministic chances right off the bat. So I don't want to, I don't want to close that door. I think grounding explanations provide reason why, reasons why as well. Um, and maybe there's even more kinds than that. <clears throat> so it might just be helpful to um, contrast this kind of argument with a nearby argument that is sometimes suggested in the literature, according to which uh, this is also on your handout. So predictions in statistical mechanical sorry, predi predictions in statistical mechanics are made using probabilistic rules. And in order for predictions in statistical mechanics to be made using probabilistic rules, irrelevant probabilities must be objective. Here I take it that Q1 is really uncontroversial. Um, we get that just from looking at the science. But Q2 is quite controversial. It's not obvious that anything that plays a role in generating scientific predictions has to be wholly objective in the sense I'm describing. Okay, so the key question is going to be why we should endorse or if we should endorse premise one in the explanatory role argument and I think there's a really good reason to be optimists about this premise or to take sort of the default position to be to endorse it and that is that scientists seem to do this uh, so we should too. So scientists seem to use probabilities to explain statistical mechanical phenomena, so we should too. Um, that's not the only reason, or I'm not sure that that should be the only reason for endorsing this argument, and I, again, I'll say more about that um, as we go. So in particular, if you want a particular case to think about, so suppose that um, you're, you know, you're rushing around your apartment getting ready to go on your annual vacation to Tahiti and you leave a banana sitting on your kitchen counter, you come back, the banana has rotted, right? Why did that happen? The standard scientific explanation is that the probability of the banana rotting is uh, very high. Statistical mechanics endorses the possibility of the banana not having rotted, right? So all of the particles in the banana and in the in your kitchen in the room when you shut the door could have been arranged just such that the banana didn't rot right but the probability of them of it rotting is nonetheless very high similarly I take it that um, scientists use one on your handout to also explain patterns so you know patterns to do with bananas in general. So most bananas that are left on the counter for two weeks rot. Again, it is possible for a banana not to rot um, over the course of two weeks, but it's extremely unlikely. And more generally, and this is the thing I think they're more, they more explicitly say as opposed to particular claims about bananas, they use the high probability of entropy increasing over time for a closed system that's not in equilibrium to explain the fact that most such systems behave in accordance with the second law of thermodynamics. So most such systems, in most such systems, the entropy does in fact increase over time. So that's the kind of mega pattern that they're using these probabilities to explain. Okay, yeah, Eddie? Um, at this point, would you like to kind of contrast between probability and typicality? This is kind of explanations. So the examples you gave, are compatible with typicality, the notion of a majority or most, mm -hmm. um, that does explanation. The probability is just a community kind of um, categorization of typicality over, say, state space. So you can make the same argument by say it's not probability that are fundamental objective, uh -huh. but typicality themselves are objective. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm thinking of the explanatory role argument in um, as being one that is trying to establish that there's genuine probability here as opposed to just typicality. And there's going to be um, a question that I'm not going to say a ton about today, although it's definitely part of the project, which is why I think that the probabilistic explanation is better than the typicality explanation. But you can see how there would be a really similar sort of style of argument here. You'd have to say, 
I mean, uh, typicality explanations only work if you parameterize the face space in a certain kind of way, right? So insofar as you think that claims about typicality genuinely explain uh, statistical mechanical phenomena, you're going to have to say something like there's an objectively correct way to uh, parameterize the space. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think it can be pretty robust across different partition on the state space and even choices and metrics as long as you, it's not too contrived. Yes, that's right. But there are ways of um, putting a measure, of parameterizing the space and putting a measure on it that you get. Yeah. That's the same for probability. In the sense that probability depends on a certain class of partitioning over state space, a certain class of measures. Uh -huh. How our probability measures can explain the phenomena we want to explain. It's going to depend on what you think the deterministic probabilities are. So if you think that they're coming out of the structure, like the distribution of abnormal versus normal microstates in the phase space, if you think that that's what's giving rise to the probabilities, then yeah, you're also going to have uh, to make the same kind of claims for the probabilistic explanation. Yeah, Isaac. Just to get clarity on this point. Yeah, so I like um, the probability distributions I'm familiar with being defined in statistical mechanics uh, do depend on a, on a coarse gradient of phase space. Mm -hmm. um, are there? Are you thinking there are others that won't, or other other accounts of the probabilities that that don't depend on how you carve up phase space? But that do they? Sorry, yeah. Could you say something very short about that? Um. Right, so there's something very suggestive, which is that if you parameterize the space in a certain way, then almost any measure over it is going to um, match the kind of probabilistic claims that scientists make. So the vast majority of states are going to be such that they lead to entropy increase over time. And uh, that seems really close to what we often say, which is like the entropy is extremely likely to increase over time. So it's really nat so I think there's um, there that gives you good reason for thinking that there should be some kind of metaphysical connection between probability and um, and the measure. Yeah. But I don't think that it's like written in stone that you have to say that's deterministic chances that um, the probabilities that show up in statistical mechanics are connected in any particular way to that measure. Yeah. It would certainly be, insofar as you thought they were totally independent of those kinds of facts, then you would be like, failing to take advantage of something really suggestive in um, the world. I mean, maybe you would have to say that it's a weird coincidence. Maybe that's the right way to put it. Like, it, there seems to be a weakness in that kind of theory in that uh, there's this coincidence, which is that the measure facts and the probability facts seem to line up in this nice way, but your metaphysics of the probability facts isn't taking advantage of that in any sense. So you just have to say, well, it's weird that it turned out like that or something like that. Um, yeah. I've had more thoughts about that in the past, so if we keep talking about it, I might be able to say more that would be helpful. But. Okay, so the goal for today is to show that if the explanatory role argument is sound, then it places some constraints on the metaphysics of deterministic chance in ways that seem to be really underappreciated in the literature on deterministic chances. Um, so that means that I'm not really trying to convince you insofar as you think there aren't any such things, insofar as you're an incompatibilist about chance and determinism, I'm not going to try to convince you otherwise. I'm just going to... Um, I'm mostly speaking to people that like this kind of argument. I think if you don't like this kind of arguments, then you might get some fodder in what I say uh, for uh, explaining why you don't like it. But I'm mostly talking to people that like this kind of argument. The explanatory role argument. Top of the handout. Um, OK. So the first constraint I take it is um, is super obvious, but I also think it sometimes goes underappreciated. And that is top of the second page of the handout, the explanatory constraints. So um, if premise one is true, then deterministic chances explain patterns of statistical mechanical events. And this is going to rule out a straightforward actual frequency account of deterministic chance. Why is that? 
because on a straightforward actual frequency account of deterministic chance, it, chance the claim that the probability, say, of any particular banana rotting when it's been left on the counter for two weeks, it's very high, is just to say that is just to say that most bananas that are left on the counter for two weeks rot. So you can't use the claim about probability to explain the claim about the pattern because they're just the same claim and nothing explains itself. Okay. You might, the actual frequentist might try to get clever here and say, fine, I don't want to use one to explain, say, BP, the pattern claim on the handout. Instead, I just want to use it to explain facts about particular events. So the probability claim, which just is the pattern claim, explains facts about particular events. Okay. So the first thing I'll say about this, I'm not sure, so the first thing I'll just register is that it seems really weird to me to explain the part of something, a part of something, by pointing to the thing as a whole. Okay, so it seems like a weird kind of explanation to say, so why does this particular banana rot? Because most bananas rot. Okay. At least, or this is especially true if we're focused on the, if we keep in mind the kind of explanation that's relevant to the explanatory role argument, right? So obviously, if somebody says, if what somebody's really asking is, like, why should I expect this banana to rot? And you say, most bananas rot. That seems really relevant in the sense of giving them um, a good reason to have that kind of expectation or um, yeah, giving them a helpful rule of thumb for making predictions along these lines or something like that. But insofar as that's the reason why the banana rotted, because most bananas rot, that seems like a weird kind of claim to make. But there's also another worry with that way of going, which is, I think you still owe us some story about what explains the pattern fact. Okay. Which is on the, okay, so you could say, what explains the fact that this particular banana rotted the fact that most bananas rot? And I think there's a follow-up question, which is, what explains the fact that most bananas rot? And the actual frequentist doesn't have any explanation to give there. And to leave that kind of pattern unexplained, I take it, is a significant cost of a theory. So I think one of the um, most robust norms governing scientific practice is that you shouldn't leave robust patterns unexplained. And uh, that's exactly what the clever actual frequentist is doing here, or what I'm s suggesting that they might try to do in trying to um, head them off. There might be an explanation in terms of something more fundamental. Okay. You know, the chemical composition of bananas. So that would avoid your point, I think, that you're making right now. Okay, so how... I think that the, the probability explanation explains particular bodies. Mm -hmm. It doesn't explain the, the regularity. The regularity is explained by a more fundamental explanation. Hmm. Okay. The regularity is explained by a more fundamental explanation like the chemical composition. Yeah. I mean, eventually that would have to come to the end. Yeah, so that's I the... I don't really think you can make your point, you can, but um, uh -huh. chalk it up to nitpicking. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, Alex. So, I was just thinking if you push it all the way, could they end up saying, oh, it's the bananas, most bananas rot because of the initial conditions plus yeah. the laws, or is you're already thinking that's just not in any way a satisfying, a satisfactory explanation? Yeah, so that's where we're going to end up, is trying to figure out why we should prefer, if we should prefer, uh, the probabilistic explanation over those kinds of initial condition explanations. Okay. So I'm not sure what to say about those, but this, this route I think is going to end up in the same place as we end up eventually anyway. Yeah. But if it doesn't seem like that, then you can raise the question again. Okay, I also just, maybe there aren't a lot of actual frequentists out there, so I just also want to point out that I think that this definitely makes trouble for one aspect of Karl Hoffer's human objective chance, 
So on Hoffer's view, chances arise in a bunch of different ways, but he says that sometimes chances are just there. He's got this way of saying it where he says, sometimes chances are just there to be discerned in the pattern of events, which I take it means that sometimes you just get chances when you have a certain kind of stable, robust, long-term frequency, relative frequency. Okay? And I think that this is going to make trouble at least for that, those sorts of um, Hafferian human objective chances. I also think that this has the potential to make trouble for Humean best systems analysis accounts of deterministic chance as well, or at least to uh, point out a place where those accounts need to be developed in more detail. That's because on those accounts, <coughs> On any Humean account, the chances depend on the Humean mosaic, and in a lot of cases, they're going to depend pretty straightforwardly, in particular, on a certain aspect of the mosaic, which is these robust uh, patterns. But now we're also saying that uh, chances are explaining those very patterns in the mosaic, right? uh, which suggests that in some sense the mosaic uh, also depends on the chances. Okay? So it's, it's looking in a worrying way like you have a kind of circularity of dependence or a circularity of explanation, whichever way you want to spell it out. Okay, so if you want to do it in terms of explanation, you say, look, um, the chances depend on the mosaic. That suggests that, um, that the mosaic explains the chances, but I've just argued that um, insofar as we're endorsing this kind of argument for deterministic chances, then the chances um, also explain the mosaic, so now we have a circle of explanation. Does that make sense? That was not the clearest description, but the idea is that you're going to have a circularity here either of explanation or dependence, depending on which way you want to talk. Uh, yeah. Would there be any difference if you were, instead of talking about chances, you were talking about some other scientific concept? Yeah, um, I think it's a, it's a good question for the Humeans. So I don't think that that's part of a standard Humean approach, although um, I guess like Hall has recently been suggesting that this is the right thing to do, is you should give like a best systems account of mass and other concepts like that. So maybe this would also arise for um, that sort of view. But maybe here's an easier example that might speak to what you're thinking of laws. right? So I take it the very same problem is going to arise for laws. So on the Humean view, one version of which is the best systems analysis, inspired by Lewis, the mosaic, right, is the laws are grounded in the mosaic. In a lot of cases, they're going to depend uh, really straightforwardly on the regularities in the mosaic. So that suggests that the mosaic, in some sense, is the explanation for the laws. It's the reason why certain claims are laws, but then the fact that those claims are laws also explains the mosaic on a very standard story about what the role that laws play in, in scientific theories. Okay. Yeah, so I think it's exactly the same point in the law and chances case. Right, so um, in a 2012 paper, Barry had this suggestion, which is that uh, the circle isn't worrying. Right, the suggestion was made, um, was only explicitly made in print, I think, with, with respect to laws. Actually, I can't remember right now. <laughs> I think it was made with respect to laws, but exactly the same point is going to carry over. 
the suggestion is that the mosaic explains the chances in a specific way. It metaphysically explains the chances, and the chances explain the mosaic in a very different kind of way. They scientifically explain the mosaic, and the circle is not worrying because as you traverse it, the type of explanation involved changes. Yeah, it's like, did I get that wrong? No, no, okay. no. <laughs> but even before this, um, what is the, uh, what are the explananda? What, so, so going this way, you might think the explananda is just some particular event, but going mm -hmm. this way, it's, it's not a particular event. Yeah, so this is kind of, right, so I take it that the interesting explananda to focus on, and there might be other things that are explained, is the uh, patterns in the mosaic. So in the case of laws, the you know, exceptionalist regularities, in the case of chances, the robust frequencies. Those, I take it, are metaphysically explaining the chances, and the suggestion is the chances scientifically explain those patterns. There's, you can make the same move as I suggested for the actual frequentist a minute ago, where you say something like, no, I never meant that the chances uh, explain the patterns. I just thought the chances or the laws explain particular events. But then again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you, okay, so what explains the patterns in the mosaic? And there's a couple moves to make, but the ultimate one is, you better not be telling me that you're leaving them unexplained. Okay, so yeah. the chance explains the pattern, but of course, whatever the actual pattern is, it could probably be incredibly low according to the chances. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, and a point that doesn't arise in the law case. So. I think you can explain things with low probability, so I don't yeah. think that to be an objection. It's just yeah, I mean, that's obviously one of the things that you can say in response. I was trying to think through if you need to say that. I'm not quite sure on, on my feet right now. Eddie, yeah? You might think that there are subsystems cause isolated from each other that uh, demonstrate Sure, but if she, but if you're explaining the whole pattern, then you're, then the explanation is not a subsystem. I'm thinking that the whole pattern can mean not actual trajectory from the micro particles, but in terms of say, you know, whole space time manifold, but including the partitioning into subsystems, and you see the you see the patterns emerging in each different subsystem, and um, you know when time goes to infinity. The the, yeah, those are different explanations the one I was talking about, or the one I oh, think so you're pointing to. Plan to from yeah. So yeah, if you explained only subsets of the mosaic, then you wouldn't have this. It would be as low probability, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't mean yet by subset of the oh. mosaic. I mean, take the mosaic, chop it up into subsystems, and um, the chances explain the distribution of frequencies in the subsystems. The row empirical equals to you the know, row theoretical chances. Yeah, those are all going to be different explanations of what we're talking about. Right, I'm saying that you can think of the mosaic being explained as a growing period of distribution. As explaining each of those. Yeah, so that, that's just another, that's just a different explanation. It's different, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a decent strategy though, is a different way of trying to break the circle is to try to identify um, a different explanation that's at stake, mm -hmm. as opposed yeah. to yeah. this way, which is to try to identify a different type of explanation. Um, yeah, Ezra? Yeah, yeah. sorry. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, you can still get this circularity problem going with partial explanation. Uh -huh. So you could say, well, maybe the chances partially explain the mosaic, and that may fully explain some particular aspect of the mosaic. Mm -hmm. And that's still a problem if you think that the mosaic is explaining the chances. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't need to commit to the explanation being the same in both cases. Yeah, that might be that might be right. Once you bring in um, partial explanation, I am like glossing over a bunch of more careful things I should be saying about that. Yeah, good point. Um, I think the the burden on someone who wants to go this route is to tell us more about um, about what these 
things are and probably in particular about this one. So one reason why I think this sounds really initially plausible is if you have the following kind of picture in mind. So explanations are backed by different kinds of relations in the world. Metaphysical explanations are backed by causal relations. So when A causes sorry, metaphysical explanations are backed by grounding relations. So when A metaphysically explains B, then A grounds B. Scientific explanations are backed by causal relations. So when A scientifically explains B, then A causes B. And that makes metaphysical, insofar as you have that kind of picture in your head, that makes metaphysical explanation and scientific explanation seem like they're totally different kinds of uh, things. They just have a similar structure. And that suggests that the, this kind of circle might not be so worrying after all. I think the question for that way of thinking about things is, so this is not, I take it, especially not on like a Humean, I take it a Humean who likes to kind of best systems analysis would be especially worried to find out that this is a straightforward, that there's a straightforward causal relation here that chances cause the patterns in the mosaic. Okay. Um, similarly for laws. Why do I think that's worrying? Um, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that it's just not obvious that chances are the kinds of things that enter into causal relations. So on a standard story about causation. Well, that, I mean, would be at least the counterfactual things might be related mm -hmm. is that the chance weren't as high as such and such, then that event wouldn't have occurred or that its chance would have been much smaller. Yeah, so, yeah, maybe if you had mere um, counterfactual dependence, that might be a little bit more amenable. I was thinking the first thing to say is just that, um, yeah, that chances are supposed to hold, sorry, that causation is supposed to hold between particular events and these at least are not particular events. Um, maybe you just want to jettison that like very standard view about causation and have a different one. Um, I also have this kind of like vague sense that it would be really weird to think of chances as like things out in the world that are making other things happen and that's the kind of picture that this suggests. But maybe that's because I have... It's an anti intuition. Yeah, yeah. Grounding. Sorry? So the metaphysical explanation uh, is about grounding. Can you explain that to us? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I think it's pretty common to use, to talk about one thing happening or one thing being a certain way in virtue of another thing in cases where it doesn't seem like there's any causal relation. So like the table has the properties that it has as a macrophysical object in virtue of the properties that you know, its component parts have and the way that they're arranged. I think that is like a very prosaic thing to hear and understand even as a non-philosopher. Um, and I think it's not obvious at all to think that uh, the parts of the table cause the table to be any certain way. Maybe one way to bring that out is standard. Maybe this is also something to say about causation here. I think standard paradigm examples of causation are diachronic. So if A causes B, then A happens before B. Um, but that certainly doesn't work in the uh, table case. So I'm trying to suggest that A, an in virtue of claim is really natural to make here, and B, it's also natural to think that it's not a causal claim. So grounding, I think, is just, it's the easiest way to introduce it to non-philosophers is just to say grounding is just this basket into which we put all of the kind of in virtue of explanations that aren't causal explanations. Now does that map perfectly onto the philosopher, like the standard accounts of grounding in the literature? I don't know. Or not, I don't know. It doesn't map perfectly on there. Uh, it, but it depends exactly who you're talking to. Some people go that route. 
Maybe very, a, very few people, you know, very few people would say a virtue of instead of because. Yeah, I agree with that, but I also think that um, right. So the table has the properties it has because of the nature of its parts and the way they are arranged. So I say that, and then Alex says, "Wait a minute, you think the." nature of the parts and the way they're arranged causes the table to be a certain way? I think that would be a fair thing to say in response. The right thing to, for me to say is, uh, no, I didn't, I wasn't meaning to, I used the word because, but I wasn't trying to make a causal claim, right? So, okay, so what kind of claim was I trying to make? Yeah. An another good example that sometimes gets people going is, um, like if you think about, uh, okay, so why, it is you got it is that satisfactory or totally not you're still very skeptical of grounding well i have a different concept of cause so. uh-huh so you're happy to use cause in all those cases i, I don't think events cause other events uh, so my concept of cause would be a different kind uh-huh okay I think the grounding literature might be really weird and inaccessible to non-philosophers, and I'm, I am happy to own that as a metaphysician who takes part in that literature on occasion, but I do not think that the, like, the target concept that we're aiming for is that weird or inaccessible to non-philosophers. We might do a really bad job aiming for it, at, or like with what we produce when we're aiming for it, but I, I um, agree with some of the proponents of grounding that this is not like a crazy thing to or totally foreign concept to be working with for what that's worth um okay so i think that insofar as you like this account you need to tell us more about um, what these two things are so that we can be sure that they are distinct a really easy way to do that would be the sort of distinction between explanations that are backed by grounding versus the ones that are backed by causation. If you wanted to go that way, great. Then um, we immediately have another constraint on the um, metaphysics of deterministic chance, which is that they have to be the kinds of things that can enter into causal relations. Okay. And maybe you're happy with that. Another kind of scientific explanation is unifying explanation. Yes, good. So. Um, I agree that I agree with that. I'm worried about whether that is going to undermine premise two in the argument. Okay. Why is that? So I'm worried that if what you mean by explanation is just the explanation of some phenomena is whatever unifies that phenomena, that sounds a lot more like this kind of epistemic notion of explanation where that makes the phenomena easier for us to understand or something like that. But why should, um, right, it's not obvious to me that what you have with a unification account of explanation is really a way of picking out the reason why some phenomena occurred. Yeah, that may be, but it still may be an objective feature of a uh, system that it's more, one system that's more unifying than another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that sounds right to me. Um, right, so in order to be the kind of thing that unifies statistical mechanical phenomena, probabilities have to be objective. Do you think that's true? I mean, I think that they could be objective and unify things, but it's not obvious to me that you get the same kind of, yeah, it seems like it um, shifts the kind of bump in the rug to premise two in the argument. Objectively unified. Objectively unified. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So even though I think that this 
constraint, the explanatory constraint, is like super obvious, I still think it hasn't been totally appreciated in the literature on deterministic chance. So if the reason why you um, think that there are deterministic chances is because you endorse this kind of explanatory rule argument, then you better make sure that ch deterministic chances are in fact the kinds of things that can explain statistical mechanical events. And that might be a lot more complicated than it first appears. Okay. I think that there, have to be, there has to be at least one other constraint that follows from the explanatory role argument on deterministic chance. So there has to be at least one more thing that we can say about the metaphysics of deterministic chance insofar as we endorse that argument. Um, to see why that is the case, I think it's helpful to contrast the explanatory role argument for deterministic chance with the explanatory role argument for indeterministic chance. So this is the part way down page two of the handout. So the first premise there, which is on the handout is R1, is that probabilities explain indeterministic quantum mechanical phenomena. So I'm saying in on like a really standard textbook interpretation of quantum, quantum mechanical phenomena or on like a GRW interpretation of quantum mechanical phenomena. Okay. Probabilities explain those phenomena. Um, and in order to explain indeterministic quantum mechanical phenomena, the relevant probabilities have to be objective. This establishes that there are indeterministic chances and here I think there is exactly the same initial argument for the first premise. Like This is what scientists seem to be doing, so it should be the kind of default approach for the rest of us. But there's also this second, much stronger backup argument. So this is, I say, insofar as you're interested, I say a bunch more about this in um, this paper that's just out in philosophy of science, but the backup argument is that if chances don't explain the sort of quantum mechanical phenomena in question, then nothing does. And something has to explain that phenomena. Okay. To think otherwise would be to violate a key norm of standard scientific practice. So I'm thinking here in particular of like really robust patterns in quantum mechanical phenomena. So like patterns in um, radioactive decay, it's an easy one to think about. Or if you want to think about um, like simple cases of, you know, silver atoms going through stern gerlach magnets that are oriented in, in uh, certain kind of ways. The idea is you can have these really robust patterns in the way that quantum mechanical systems behave, but the very theories that we're interested in are precisely those that say that that phenomena, those, pa that those patterns are indeterministic. So there's nothing about the system before the relevant trial takes place that determines how the system is going to behave. So it doesn't seem like there's any other available explanation for the robust pattern in the behavior of the system other than saying something like, well, the reason why you know, half of the atoms decay in this 20 minute period is because they have a half-life of 20 minutes, i.e. because the probability of each one decaying in the next 20 minutes is a half. Okay, Eddie? Yeah, so when you think about stochastic theories, probably uh -huh. this is the fundamental role. If you look in the consensus in scientific communities, I don't think there is a clear answer what they believe to be a good explanation for. Um, so many yeah. people in quantum mechanical foundations, they think about the wave function as some kind of epistemic summary of what's going on. The probabilities for them is also kind of epistemic. I don't know whether it's coherent view, but um, that's one thing. Even for G in the GR, GRW, it's a garage mm -hmm. itself. And I think Andrew Lebasi, uh, who are still developing GRW to you know, put tests and so on, they are thinking about the stochastic theory as always pointing us to something more fundamental, maybe deterministic in the end. Uh -huh. In that sense, the probability is a kind of step, uh, placeholder for something fundamental that explains quantum mechanical phenomena. Yeah. 
I'm open to, yeah, so I'm open to the idea that um, more careful, like, sociological research on physicists might show that they don't actually think that probabilities explain in this kind of way. Um, that's why I think it's important to see the existence of this backup argument, because to some extent I think it's, a, it's it is independent of the particular beliefs of scientists involved. So there's one sort of uh, argument for metaphysical theories kind of from science that says, so here's your scientific theory, now I'm going to read my metaphysics off of it. There's another kind of argument, and it's this latter kind that I'm trying to make here, which is here's a really robust pattern in standard scientific practice that suggests that there's a certain kind of norm that governs standard scientific practice. Right. In this case, the one I'm interested in is don't leave robust patterns unexplained. Okay. Insofar as that's a norm that governs standard scientific practice, presumably we should also be licensed to appeal to it in metaphysics. Right. I mean, if we're following the same kind of methodology that the scientists are, uh, we certainly can't be faulted for that, I take it. Um, so insofar as you have a case where if you were to say, well, there really aren't any such things as indeterministic objective probabilities, so you'd have to leave these robust patterns in the phenomena unexplained, then you ought not do that. You ought to say, no, there are these things, objective probabilities. What do they do? They explain patterns in the phenomena. What are they? Maybe you don't know, but it's worth it to introduce them into your ontology because you need something to play this kind of explanatory role. And I think that's the key question for people like Gerardi, right? If they really think that, um, sorry, maybe you weren't attributing this view uh, to him, but to people who think that the uh, wave function is just, just a kind of epistemic construct or it just tells us like what we ought to believe about certain kinds of situations, right? So there are robust patterns in the way that quantum mechanical systems behave, right? If the wave function doesn't explain those patterns, it's not clear what else possibly could, right? It seems like there wouldn't be any explanation for those patterns. So you would have to leave them unexplained. And I take it that would be a huge cost to such a theory. Yeah, that's why you can't be a subjectivist about the wave function. Well, I think maybe that's why there's an implicit premise here. Oh yeah? Take uh-huh. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sure. Bayesian or even Angela Bassi, who develops UFW, they don't think that QM or the stochastic theory is unbendable. Yeah, okay. They're holding hope for something else to explain. Yeah. I'm, to I'm totally happy to take that on board. So I'm just thinking of like a textbook version of um, quantum mechanics or like at least a textbook version of GRW, which says, here's the fundamental law, um, you know, set row equal to this and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah, Harry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, because I, <laughs> I think that uh, maybe you can spend some time addressing this, but I, I, I'm struggling to see how this second argument flies. Uh, I mean, is this satisfying that just because, uh, so if something does, uh, what? If, if this doesn't explain it, then nothing does, and something must explain it. Why? Because that's how scientists behave, as if things can be explained. Um, well, what if, the, what if the behavior is wrong? I mean, I, I guess I don't, I don't follow how that is an argument in favor that, that this must be an explanation. Mm -hmm. I guess this yeah, so. I'm open to the idea that scientists get things wrong. Very open to it. Um, I think if I wasn't open to it, then the argument would be like way shorter, or would take a to would like ought to be done in a taking place in a sociology department, or like by way of survey. Um, here's what I think. So, um, insofar as we have any confidence in our ability to figure out what the objective world is like. Sci the scientific method is like a paradigm example of good inquiry into um, what the world is like. Right? 
So particular scientists can get things wrong, science can go off track, but insofar as there are really robust patterns in, sci in scientific practice that show up again and again and again, and when you take those patterns, right, so, and those patterns suggest a certain kind of norm that's governing scientific theory choice, and you take that norm and you apply it in metaphysics and you get a certain result, I think we ought to endorse that result. Okay. I think maybe metaphysicians are licensed to do like lots of things that scientists don't do in addition. I'm totally happy with that. But I think that, um, right, that insofar as we're just following these really robust aspects of scientific methodology, we're always in good standing. You seem to be begging the question there because you're assuming that you're assuming that science is good and you're proving that the methods are good. But if the methods aren't good, then science isn't good. So. I'm saying that, um, that we don't have any better grip on what would be a good way to go about figuring out what the world is like. Well, maybe there is other than... Let's say there was no need for an explanation. Then I would say, great, you don't need indeterministic probabilities. But in making that claim, you're also going to have to um, question a huge number of instances of theory choice that scientists engaged in. So it's going to be sure. extraordinarily scientifically revisionary. Sure. Now maybe you're open to being really scientifically revisionary in this way I'm talking about, which again is not just like if a scientist says it, we have to follow it. It's this looking for patterns that show up again and again, right? Um, but I'm not I guess in the, so sorry, can you let me finish? Sure. So, um, right, so even if you are open to being scientifically revisionary, I think that you ought to be, you ought to sort of start from a position of not being that revisionary. So I think you should be at least optimistic in uh, the scientific method as a way of figuring out what the world is like and see what kind of results that gives you in metaphysics. If at the end of the day you run into some kind of wall there or you have an argument that overturns that, then that's all well and good. But I think this is about as firm a starting point as metaphysicians ever, ever have. Yeah. You're, you're getting to that conclusion because you're saying, look, science works, so therefore we should follow their methods. Is that right? I'm saying that we don't have any, so I don't see any other firm starting place for figuring out how we should go about inquiring into what the world is like other than the scientific method. So yes, I'm starting from a position of saying, I'm starting from a position of saying that um, we shouldn't be scientific, re scientifically revisionary if we can help it. And I'm not trying to give a justification for that. Oh, okay. It's extremely rare that anybody is like, how could you possibly count on science? <laughs> no, that basically never happens when I give this argument. <laughs> but your logic here is, 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 is that you don't have to just, it seemed, that's why I took it to me, that you don't have to justify the scientific method because, because we trust science. But uh, mm -hmm. I would think that you could only trust science after you justify the scientific method. Philosophy can't rely on science. They have to, they have to prove that, that the scientific method is good and then we could trust science. Science really depends on philosophy, so I Um, yeah, I mean, I think that if I, right, so, I guess that, I think one thing to say is that nobody can do everything, so you have to take something as a kind of foundational starting point, right? Um, and this, I think, is a very good one for metaphysicians to operate from. I think there, is an other, there are other like, very good area, uh, avenues of inquiry available to people who are doing like, philosophy of science to try to figure out whether or not they think the scientific method is legitimate or if there are some like, overarching reasons to question it or something like that. Yeah. You had a question over here? I think it's sort of, I have another question, but I think it's better to, say, to be saved until the end. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the key claim to make here 
is that there is no backup argument of this sort, of the sort that I just gave for R1 for P1. Okay, so it's not the case that if probabilities don't explain statistical mechanical phenomena, for instance, then nothing does. Okay. At least at first glance, it looks like there are other available explanations of that phenomena. So insofar as you endorse the first premise in the explanatory role argument, then you have to think that um, the probabilistic explanation of statistical mechanical phenomena is in some sense superior. Right? Maybe because the alternative non-probabilistic explanation is just a non-starter, like it just gets disqualified, it's not an explanation at all, or just because you're operating with some kind of inference to the best explanation and you think the probabilistic explanation is better. Okay, so I think that this is going to lead to at least some further constraint on the metaphysics of deterministic chance um, insofar as you endorse that kind of explanatory role argument. How do you get that? that, that why? What is it going to do with yeah, what is the constraint? Well, I'm going to try to give you some suggestions for what the constraint is in a second, but I'm, I... The point is just that. That's okay. Yeah. It looks not okay. This sentence is just a. This sentence is not something we're supposed to have already understood. It's what you're going on to next. Um. I think I have established that there has to be some further constraint. I don't think I've told you anything about what the constraint is yet. Because I think you have to have, insofar as you endorse premise one, you have to think that the probabilistic explanation is better than the alternative non-probabilistic explanation. And that's going to tell you, so you're going to have a claim of the form. Deterministic, remember the constraint, I, the first constraint was deterministic chances have to explain statistical mechanical phenomena. Now there's going to be another one of the following form. Deterministic chances have to explain statistical mechanica in the statistical mechanical phenomena in the following way, where that way is identifying some feature that makes the explanation better than um, the alternative non-probabilistic explanations. So that's what I'm thinking. What's the alternative non-probabilistic I'm going to do it in just a sec. Oh, I guess I'm just thinking that... Let me ask a, let me ask a, maybe a related question. Okay. Would, would, it, would, it, would it have suited you okay if at the very beginning, instead of saying probabilities explain statistical mechanical phenomena, you had instead said explanations of statistical mechanical phenomena that use probabilities? Would that be just as good? Uh-huh. That's all you I, I mean, I guess I'm worried about... Um, I guess you'd have to say a little bit more about what use means in order to make sure that premise two is in good standing. So um, it can't be something like, I'm trying to think of a way that the, the explanation might use a probability, but it didn't need to be objective. Um, I'm, not having a, I'm not thinking of a good way right now, but I suspect that somebody clever could say, uh, I don't know, it mentions the word probability, that counts as using probability, but the probability doesn't have to be objective in order to get mentioned in the explanation. It might be objective, but it might not be a thing. I think uh -huh. that, that might be the point of some mind. The way the sentence, sentence works is that probability is explained, uh -huh. and it gets assimilated to causes explained. Uh -huh. And so you seem to be going in the direction of wanting to identify a probability with some sort of an, an item. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. It might be that probabilities qualify, I don't know, states of affairs, mm -hmm. and that they, it's the states of affairs that do the explanation. Mm -hmm. but probabilities play a role in the explanation by qualifying the state of affairs. Mm -hmm. explaining. Yeah, and I think in that sense of use, then the argument would be just fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because I think they'd have to be objective. Very bright, but I was thinking about the causal picture up there. Uh -huh. Sort of making chances something that um, you say it makes it look like an event, but 
the explanation use that could use chances. Uh -huh. But in this case, I was bringing it up because the constraint seemed to be a constraint on the explanation, and a sort of constraint on the nature of the of the of the uh -huh. I'm just thinking that any constraint on the what the probabilistic explanation is is in virtue of that a constraint on the nature of deterministic chance. Ezra? Uh, yeah, I was also slightly uh, confused by this step just because huh. I was thinking that someone might think um, uh, that the argument goes through just because the non-probabilistic explanations are inadequate. Oh, right. In a way that's kind of independent of the nature of the probabilities themselves. Right. So if you thought that, you wouldn't think that there's any further constraint being generated. Okay, that's a, good, that's a good point, and one that I actually uh, teed you up for, because I said, that's one way in which you could, <laughs> yeah, okay, that's right, yeah. Okay, so maybe I should say, right, there's at least a possibility of some further constraint. Right. You, shouldn't, you shouldn't sleep happy with your metaphysics until you figure out why it is that the probabilistic explanation is better than the alternative, because there may be some further constraint on your metaphysics lurking in that story. Exactly. Okay, great. Okay, so um, the most obvious alternative non-probabilistic explanation, I think, is going to just involve the actual initial conditions plus the deterministic fundamental laws. So on one such view, and I think there's more than one available, but I think the most straightforward one, the fact that this particular banana rotted when you left it on the counter for two weeks is explained by the fact that by what's on your handout as two, when you left the banana on the counter for two weeks, the system started off in an initial, mi in initial microstate M1, and in combination with the fundamental laws, M1 led deterministically to the banana rotting. And then the pattern fact, right, that most bananas rot is gonna be explained by three. So in each instance, when somebody leaves a banana on the counter, for two weeks, the system starts off in initial microstate, and then you're gonna have a nice big list, M1 or M2 or what have you, and in combination with the fundamental laws, all of those initial microstates lead to, deterministically to rotting. What's this system? Uh, I'm just trying to leave, I'm trying to not make any claims about at which state it gets, at which stage it's closed or pseudo-closed. Might not so, be closed at all. Yeah. Might be the whole universe. Right. Someone might think that's a terrible explanation. Mm -hmm. Maybe because subjectively it's a bad explanation. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that, in other words, we'd never understand it, you could never formulate yeah. it. Yeah. I agree with that. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's even where you're going. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, insofar as you um, endorse the explanatory rule argument, you're going to have to think that one is a better explanation of the fact that the particular banana rotted than two is, or that it's a better explanation of the fact that most bananas rot than three is, right? Um, the, or maybe you think both of those things. And the question is why? Why do you think that the probabilistic explanation is superior, right? And Remember that you better not say, this is going to relate to your point, Barry, um, that it's more useful to creatures like us because, say, we, don't, we usually don't know the initial microstates of systems. To do that, I think, would be uh, to undermine the second premise in the explanatory role argument because insofar as it's a better explanation because it's useful to creatures like us, it's not obvious that the probabilities in that explanation need to be objective. Okay, and insofar as you think that the, so the more useful to creatures like us might be especially salient to you once you start thinking about the fact that, you know, it's not just the particles in the banana or the particles in the room or whatever. I'm trying to make it seem like a pseudo closed system in your lead walled apartment or something like that. Um, but once you start to think about it as a universe as a whole, you, you're very tempted to think that 
you, it would be easy to be tempted to think like, think that the initial condition explanation is just totally unuseful to us. But again, I take it that that's not, that can't be at the relevant point here. Okay. Yeah, Isaac. Um, I uh, was wondering about this ranking of explanations. Yeah. Why does it have to be, why must I think it's better than, why can't I think it's yeah. either as good as, or even worse than, um, but still an objective explanation? Yeah. I wrote this in a paper once. <laughs> Exactly, like exactly that line. I was like, who cares if the deterministic explanation is better? Um, if it's an explanation, then it has to be objective. Um, yeah. And then I got, I convinced myself that I didn't believe that and I was like embarrassed that I had published it, but um, now I'm having trouble remembering why I convinced myself that that was. So you can embarrass. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I had some great response to your question. I don't know what it was, but it was really salient to me like a month ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let me Maybe it's something like the following. So there's just no reason to posit like more uh, explanatory relations than you need in the world. That would just be to complicate your theory in an unnecessary way. Um, especially once you're thinking about explanation in the sense of being this really ontic thing. It's the reason why something occurred as opposed to just like something that gives you satisfaction or understanding. Surely there's, you can let a thousand flowers bloom as far as those are concerned. Um, yeah, maybe it was something along those lines that was getting me going. But yeah, it's a good point. Or I, I thought it was a really good point at one point. <laughs> um, yeah. One, one might take the line that like, um, perhaps all explanations are equally objective, but uh, we, we can rank them as better or worse. The better or worse ranking Yeah. Objectively, yeah. That would seem consistent with the P argument. Yeah. Um, this is actually why I included this in that line in that paper because um, I had this exchange with Elliot Sober where he was like, "You are insane to think that um, like what counts as the best explanation is anything remotely objective at all. Like obviously we're just tracking like what's useful to us in one situation or." another and I thought like an easy way to just avoid that was to be like okay I'm not talking about what counts as the best explanation I'm just talking about what counts as an explanation um, so yeah that's why why it came up was precisely that way of thinking yeah so so maybe the right thing to say for right now for what I believe right now is something like the following so you need at the very least, you know, you need some justification for including the probabilistic explanation in addition to these initial condition explanations because it's like a, a little extra complication, at least a little ex extra complication in your overall theory. So you owe us some story about why it's important that it be there. Yeah. You're not about, are, is that actually yeah, satisfactory? So, okay. So it seems like you could make that claim without making robust claims about comparative. Yeah. Methods. Of yeah. Like that. It seems totally reasonable. Yeah. Okay, we have this other <coughs> that explanation is sufficient for the phenomena, so why think yeah. that this is also a no robust objective explanation? Well, yeah. if you think it is, then you need some further constraint in that we're on the second constraint. Yeah, cool. Okay. I'm glad I have a response to my earlier self as well. <laughs> yeah. You seem to be assuming that, um, that if an explanation that explanation can't be not objective, or that I so resist. Um, uh, that while it still requires that the notion of probability that appears in it yeah. is objective. So someone might take the view that, well, what makes something a good or bad explanation is partly depends on us. Mm -hmm. But um, as a, the only way it could be a good explanation is that for us is to have an objective notion of probability. In it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so again there I would say, right, so the thought is that being objective is a necessary, 
a necessary condition for sort of like getting into the running for being, having the probabilities be objective is a necessary condition for being like in the race for best explanation. Yeah. Um, okay. And then I think I just want to say the same thing I just said to Isaac, which is something like you face some, insofar as you've gotten you know, more than one explanation in the running for being the best explanation, you, so you think those are all genuine explanations. They all identify the reason why something happens. Um, you have to have some story for why you have more than just one of them in there, and it's going to have to be. So either, yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to just say the same thing. Okay. So what I think is the natural thing to say here is to start talking about some kind of modal robustness. And I totally have lost track of whether or not this is genuinely like a natural thing to think at this point or if it's just because um, it's, it shows up a fair bit in the literature and it's something that I've sort of been like working over in my head for a while. So insofar as you're like natural in what sense? Uh, good question. I'm not totally sure. Okay. So a good place to look for reasons for thinking the probabilistic explanation is better here is the literature on special science laws in general, right? So people who argue that special science laws really are laws because they play a certain kind of explanatory role have to tell some story about why we like those kinds, the kinds of explanations that special science laws provide um, in favor, or sorry, in contrast to just the explanations that you get using the fundamental laws. Okay, and a strand that comes up there often in that literature fairly often is some kind of modal robustness. So the idea that the explanations provided by the special science laws are modally robust in some sense. I'm going to try to figure out what sense in a second. So this shows up in um, like this old paper of Jackson and Pettit's on explanatory ecumenicism that I like a lot. Um, it shows up in Strevens's papers on um, special science laws and counterfactual support. It shows up in Brad Westlake's work on explanatory depth. Okay. It also, I think, something like this is behind a lot of what Yablo says about mental causation as well, for what it's worth. Uh, okay, but what do I mean by modal robustness? Here is, I think, one very uh, straightforward thing to say, and that is that if one explains the fact that this particular banana rots, then if you had left 10 seconds later, i.e. if things had been different in some relatively small way, and the banana had still rotted, the explanation for it rotting would be exactly the same. So the explanation is modally robust in a certain kind of way. Insofar as the same phenomena occurs in a bunch of relatively nearby possible worlds, the exact same explanation um, explains all of those phenomena. As opposed to if you are using two to explain why the particular why this particular banana rotted right the explanation would have to change you would have to say so if you left the kitchen 10 seconds later that would undoubtedly have had ramifications for the initial microstate of the system like you would have disturbed air molecules in a different way that interacted with the banana later right so it would have started in a different microstate which the point presumably uh, which apparently also led deterministically to rotting. Okay, but the explanation would be slightly different. But this, and this is exactly what, uh, the suggestion that Brad Westlake makes about uh, special science laws, for what it's worth. It doesn't look to me like it, it looks to me like it works, but only for the particular alternative explanation that I spelled out here. So I think all you have to do is change that explanation slightly and the problem crops up again. So if you explain the fact that the banana rotted in the following way, when you left the banana on the counter for two weeks, the system started off an initial microstate, and then instead of naming it, you say an initial microstate in set M, 
where M contains all of the thermodynamically normal microstates, or maybe even just contains some range of thermodynamically normal microstates. Right? And uh, in combination with the fundamental laws, microstates in, N, in M lead deterministically to rotting. Okay, so now if you left, so if you had left 10 seconds later and the banana still rotted, right, the alternative explanation, the explanation on this alternative deterministic account would again be precisely the same. Okay, so there's no, it doesn't look to me like there's any advantage for the probabilistic explanation here over alternative accounts in general. Although maybe there's an advantage over this one very particular way of spelling it out. So I think we have to go some other way. The route that seems somewhat more, uh, that suggests itself to me, is the thought that uh, counterfactuals like the following are true. So if you had left 10 seconds later, the probability of the banana rotting would still have been very high. So this is a view on which the chances themselves are modally robust in a certain kind of way. And in virtue of that, the explanation um, counts as modally robust. Okay, so this is a view uh, where, and again, you don't have, or not again, but you'll see some hedging on the handout. I say it requires that chances themselves are at least somewhat modally robust, right? So I'm not saying that for any counterfactual, when we're evaluating that counterfactual, we have to hold the chances fixed. I don't think that the view requires that. It just requires that for counterfactuals um, involving relatively localized events in the antecedent, you should hold the chances fixed. Relatively localized events, like as a paradigm case, if you had left 10 seconds, the room's 10 seconds later. Right? If you had left the banana you know, on a, in a slightly different place on the counter, if you'd left two bananas on the counter, those kinds of things. Uh, well, I think whatever notion of modal robustness is operative here, if the argument's going to work, then it needs to be fully objective. Well, all, all that's in my head is that it's uh, modally robust means uh, that you're going to think about it one way rather than another. So. Yeah, so, so then I think that you would think this route would be a non-starter, if that's... All, if uh, that's I have a your concept of modal um, right, so, I, so this way of going assumes that there, there can be facts of the matter about what would have happened if things had been slightly different. Objective facts of the matter about what would have happened if things had been slightly different. So if you don't think that, then this is going to not get off the ground at all. It, gets, it should get lumped in the basket with, um, with the... Other suggestion, sorry? Other deplorable things. Yeah, which, like the one that Barry mentioned, <laughs> uh, which is to think that the explanation's better because it's useful for us. But when evaluating counterfactuals involving relatively localized events, we hold the chances fixed. Oh, uh... Okay, I see what you mean. I said that a little bit subjectively. Um, it should say something like the, the truth conditions of counterfactuals are such, such and such a way. Right, so that was my bad. Yeah. Sorry, just to clarify your notion of model robustness. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, so I was wondering, can I just clarify what exactly do we mean by relatively localized events? Because I was thinking about the scenario in which we toss a coin, um, suppose the coin's fair, and then the topography the chances of the landing on head is one half, but suppose uh -huh. that we just slightly twist the simulation of tossing it, then it would be easily biased and the chances not be So uh -huh. I think that's not the situation, the counterfactual situation you have in mind. Yeah. Um, so, so I was wondering, but then that, um, to, I'm trying to 
kind of fill, fill in the conditions, but I was worried that once you add in all this, like how you should tweak the common factual situation, one bad way of doing that would be you're kind of defining the situation, the, the admissible antecedents, such that the chances we get fixed. Yeah. So I was wondering how you would do that. Yeah. Yeah, the answer is I'm not totally sure. Um, so this is just, so I think that somebody who likes the explanatory role argument has to say something else here. The suggestion is something in terms of modal robustness. This one nice straightforward way of, going, of spelling that out that has appeared in the literature doesn't work. Here's this other way, but I, I'm totally open to the idea that there are worries about this way of, um, of going. You'll see in a second that I'm going to, um, that, that one view in the vicinity might be able to avoid any kinds of worries of your, of your type. Um, and that might be a reason for liking that kind of view if you're going this way. Um, good. Okay, so insofar as you think that chances are modally robust in this way, then you need a story about the metaphysics of deterministic chance that tells us why they are modally robust in this way. Why do you need to tell that kind of story? Because if you're just stipulating that chances are modally robust in this way, or maybe this is another way of, of um, bringing in the last point, if you, you know, if you can't identify, if you can't give any sort of um, principle definition of the, of the terms in uh, this claim, like relatively localized event, then why are you not willing to allow the advocate of these alternative non-probabilistic explanations to make the same move? So in particular, why can't they just stipulate that the truth conditions for counterfactuals are such that um, when the antecedent involves some relatively localized event, at least, uh, we hold fixed the fact that the initial conditions uh, are within some set? Okay. So if it's just a pure stipulation about chance, if it's just like, look, this is how I think the semantics of counterfactuals work, end of story, then um, that doesn't, that just, that gives the advocate of the alternative explanation an opening to just make the exact same kind of claim. You have to have some further story about why uh, chances are modally robust in this kind of way. And I think that you have to be somewhat careful about what kind of account you give. So here's a really natural uh, thing to say at this point that I think an advocate of like a Humean best systems account of deterministic chance might try to appeal to. The thought is, look, in general, when you're evaluating counterfactuals, um, the truth conditions of counterfactuals are such that um, you hold fixed as much as possible while making the antecedent true. And any change that's going to result in a change in the best systems account chances right, is going to involve things being very, very different than the way that they actually are. Right? So you can make small changes in the mosaic and presumably still have precisely the same BSA chances. It's only like a big widespread change in the mosaic that's going to give you different BSA chances. Right? Um, so it's going to follow just from that that best systems account chances are going to be at least somewhat modally robust. I think that's all well and good and kind of a plausible thing to say, but I just am worried that the advocate of the alternative non-probabilistic explanation um, is going to be able to say the very same thing. So they're going to be able to say, look, when evaluating counterfactuals, we hold fixed as much as possible while making the antecedent true. Um, but uh, any change that's going to involve the initial microstate no longer being in set M, where set M contains all the normal, thermodynamically normal initial microstates, is going to involve things being very, very different than they actually are. Okay. Um, and it's going to follow that the best systems account, uh, sorry, it's going to follow that the initial microstate being in set M is going to be um, at least somewhat modally robust. That's the thought. Yeah, Alex. Uh, so I don't think this will help break the um, parity between mm -hmm. the non-probabilistic and the probabilistic person, but I was thinking, I was confused why somebody who liked P1 uh -huh. uh, wouldn't just 
immediately go in for the chances are morally robust claim because when they when they're like elaborating on P1, what they'll say is like um, chances explain that the relative frequency of uh, some type of event in some type of situation is blah. Uh -huh. but that part in some type of situation, um, it's not like I feel like that's where the relatively localized whatever that's where yeah. that's going on. So when you say when a coin is like flipped by a person, um, blah 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 blah, it's like a type of situation. And I guess what I'm saying is in the account of the way in which the chances are explaining the frequencies, this kind of notion of type of situation already appears. So uh -huh. how would you not go in for the moral robustness is yeah. with respect to those? Hmm. I'm not I'm not sure. And maybe that's why I feel like it's a really natural thing. The modal robustness is like the natural way to go because it's something that you already are committed to. I'm not totally sure. Yeah, it seems to me like the obvious thing that, that gets added when you move to the probabilistic story. Yeah, so that's just to say I'm not totally sure that there is a viable way to avoid. I'm not, I definitely don't know whether there's a viable way for the, um, for the advocate of P1 to avoid the claim that they're modally robust. I'm not sure. And, or, I mean, surely there is one, but it would involve like really wacky semantics or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had the feeling when I read your two and three uh -huh. that you were giving a uh, account of what deterministic uh, objective uh, probabilities are. Uh huh. This, this account didn't really sound to be that different from a public public um, well, That's a very vague statement. I'm just sort of okay. So then I guess the question is. Um, it's sort of like a, you know, an account of the of a, of objective chance based on the left of the jury. You know, yeah. 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 And that, go ahead. Yeah, that actually happens a fair bit in the um, literature with the method of arbitrary functions and also with typicality, um, where like some people are like, this is typicality, it's not probability. And then other people are like, this is just what I meant by probability. Um, yeah. So I guess the question is. So what's added by saying that these sorts of explanation, that these sorts of facts um, give rise directly to facts about chance? I mean, one important thing to point out is that you are going to end up with a kind of disjunctive account of chance here, right? Because whatever your account is of indeterministic chances, it's going to be different. Um, so that might place. Of indeterministic chances? Yeah. Well, um, well or, or maybe, maybe I'm not getting the, uh, the categories right. Is his account considered to be indeterministic or deterministic? Deterministic. deterministic. Yeah. I see. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So here's just a suggestion for a view that I think would work really well here in terms of esta establishing modal robustness, the modal robustness of the explanation. And that is a view on which you've got genuinely emergent propensities. Okay. So the key feature of propensities is that they are metaphysically independent of the Humean mosaic. Indeed, this is the thing that people often complain about with uh, propensities is the idea that they come apart from the kind of empirically accessible facts in a certain kind of way that um, is troubling or problematic. But in this particular case, it looks like a great advantage because um, 
in making changes to the mosaic to ensure that the antecedent of the counterfactuals, the relevant counterfactuals like what's on your handout is BC, come out true, right, that is totally independent of making any kind of change to the propensity. So I think propensities by their very nature are going to be modally robust. And maybe they're going to be modally robust in a really wide range of situations which avoids the worry about specifying what exactly counts as a relatively localized event. Um, right. So you don't need to say that because just for pretty much all counterfactuals except, that the one, except the ones that mention chances in the antecedent, I take it they're going to leave their propensities unchanged. It might be a little too independent. Yeah, I mean, this is, so this is the point is like... I mean, remove the mosaic entirely. Uh -huh. Propensities are still there. What are yeah. they doing? Nothing. Well, they're not explaining anything because there isn't a mosaic there. But if the mosaic was there, then they would. <laughs> no, I agree. You could change the mosaic arbitrarily and it'd still be there mm -hmm. in this way of evaluating it, and so they wouldn't be explaining anything. Uh, what is the word emergence supposed to be here? Where does this come from? Emergence. By emergent here, I just mean that you've got propensities that are showing up at a like higher level of description or like a macro level description of the world that do not depend in any like robust way. You can't reduce them to or um, uh, tell a story about how they're grounded in uh, the fundamental stuff. That sounds like non-emergent. Why do people yeah, the word emergent isn't a good word to use. I assume you didn't invent this. Uh, it's, it's word I definitely didn't invent the word emergent. <laughs> <laughs> but one shouldn't have used Or in this context. One, one shouldn't use the word emergent there, I think, mm. just as a suggestion. I mean, it, the point here is that if God made the mosaic but forgot to put in the propensities, mm -hmm. he would have hadn't finished all of his work yet. Mm -hmm. So he'd have to go put in the propensities. So it's not like the propensities emerged from the mosaic. Right. Uh, I guess, yeah, the key point is that if God made the mosaic and then put in propensities that, that explain the behavior of all the fundamental stuff, his work still isn't done. So there, I need some word that um, picks out the fact that these are propensities that uh, govern or explain or, I realize this is a metaphysically weird view, uh, macrophysical stuff directly. Yeah, so maybe that word is not emergent. Although, I mean, so I think the reason why people use the, emergent, the word emergent in various contexts is they want to be like this, and this is also the reason why people find emergence really weird. It's because they want to say, here's a certain kind of phenomena. In some sense, it's independent of the underlying stuff. But in some other sense, it is dependent. Or we don't want to say that it just floats like wholly free um, in every way. So emergent mental phenomena, right? You want to say that it's independent of the underlying physical phenomena in some important way, so they can say genuinely cause your beliefs or desires or things like that. Um, your mental states can be genuine causes of other mental states and things in the world. But at the same time, you don't want to sound too crazy, so you, um, you say that, well, they're independent in one way, but not in every way. They're still dependent in some kind of sense. I take it that that's what people mean by emergent. And one reason why they do that is, be, is to try to take advantage of, um, I think what I was saying with, in response to Eddie, but maybe it was Isaac. Um, so in the mental case, right, there's this robust correlation between mental states and physical states, and they don't want to say that that's just a coincidence. Right? So they want to say, well, in some sense, the mental stuff is dependent on the physical stuff so that I don't have to just say it's a coincidence that they happen to line up in this nice way. But in some important sense, it is uh, totally independent. Well, in some important sense, it is in independent um, so that I am allowed to give it like a robust causal and explanatory role. And that might be what somebody's trying to do here too with these kinds of propensities, I'm saying somebody, um, that, that might be a reason to use the word emergent here as well because you want to say something like, well, in some way these propensities depend on the mosaic in order to take advantage of the suggestive features of the way um, 
like phase space is structured or the fact that you know virtually any measure that you put on it is going to give these kinds of claims no you have this view oh you no, know of somebody I, <laughs> I was like what <laughs> <laughs> you go down to Rutgers and your whole world view shifts yeah who has this view so I think Fodor has this view uh -huh. about special science properties okay he wanted them both to be um, extra real things there uh -huh. but to be coordinated in the right okay way. Great. At least I accused them of having this view. Uh huh. <laughs> and that why is there anything other than physics paper? Okay. Great. That might be helpful because then I can be like the crazy Fodor view, but for chances. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but people, I guess, the reason I asked the question was I've never heard this phrase emerging before, but you're, I think you're saying that other people are using the phrase emerging. Sorry, I, sorry. So I've never heard anybody else use the phrase emergent propensity. I take it that if you had a propensity account of chance and uh, you wanted a un and you like deterministic chances and you want a unified account, then you would end up with these emergent propensities. Um, I mean, that I'm envisioning them governing macroscopic stuff, but insofar as somebody who has this kind of view wants to maintain some connection between the macro and the micro stuff, then um, you might end up with some kind of governance at the micro level as well. Right. And again, there's a bit of a dilemma for somebody that wants propensities at the macro level, right? On the one hand, they uh, are going to have to fail to, they're going to have to say that there is some kind of, so they can say that the macro propensities are totally independent, in which case they have this remarkable coincidence, or they can say that they're dependent in some way, but then they have, they're making use of um, these very fishy metaphysical concepts like emergence. Yeah, maybe that's a cleaner way to I mean, this is say really all of a, this. a classic have your cake and eat it too uh -huh. view and people who have their cake and eat it end up being severely undernourished. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this, yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking you'd say the view is crazy, but undernourished works <laughs> equally well. So I'm not trying to convince anybody to endorse this view. I'm saying that this view, it looks to me, would give you a really straightforward account of modal robustness that might justify using, um, introducing probabilistic explanations in statistical mechanics, either in place of or in addition to these alternative non-probabilistic explanations. Okay? Okay, so where does that leave us the suggestion is that this is sort of a good or very natural way to go for somebody who likes the explanatory role account, uh, sorry, the explanatory role argument uh, for deterministic chance. One thing you could do here, right, is to just jettison that argument entirely. But I take it this would still, this is still a fairly philosophically substantive point if you go around pointing, uh, if you go around suggesting to people who have endorsed that argument, uh, like Barry, or like David Albert, that the metaphysical account of deterministic chance that um, they might end up committed to is some kind of emergent propensity account. I take it that would be a surprising thing for them to hear. Um, <laughs> embarrassing thing for them to hear. Um, right. So in which case, we either need a bunch more work we either need to step away from the explanatory role account for deterministic chance, or we need a bunch more work here in spelling out exactly what that argument consists in and um, how you're going to justify uh, premise one in the, in the argument. So uh, at the end of the handout, I just list a few questions that I think are outstanding here. So one question is, are there other reasons for choosing the probabilistic over the non-probabilistic explanation besides modal robustness, right? I kind of went fairly quickly to modal robustness and I own the fact that I'm not really sure where that is coming from. So maybe there's some other really salient 
uh, reason here that one of you can suggest to me. The other, a second question is, are there, is there some other account of modal robustness that's in the vicinity that I haven't suggested that gets you off the hook? Um, a small point is just that I'm taking the counterfactuals that are relevant for modal robustness to have these probabilistic consequence and maybe something changes if you take them to be non-probabilistic. The other, right, so if there isn't anything that comes out of any of those questions, then I think you end up at the end of the day saying our merger propensity is just too weird to accept into your metaphysics. And if they are, then um, should we not endorse the explanatory role argument for deterministic chance? And if you don't, again, what do you want to say about the fact that scientists seem to be endorsing that argument? I take it that we have at least some obligation to explain away their apparent endorsement of the argument, even if um, insofar as we don't think it's a very good one. Okay, thanks. <laughs>